Good morning. Welcome to worship. I am Pastor Carrie, and I serve the congregations of St. Andrews and Holy Trinity in Central Iowa. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us on Pentecost in this way. Before we begin our service, a special uh, offering of condolences to the family of Dan Kelly on his passing. Our love and our prayer surrounds you as you begin to do life in this new and different way. For all of you who have encountered loss in any way or form, as you hold your grief, we hold you in prayer. You are not alone in these days. So with that, let us come and center ourselves for worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please join me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. 
forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Our gathering hymn is, O Holy Spirit, enter in. That's number 786 in the red hymnal and number 459 in the green. Let us pray. O oh God, on this day when you open the hearts of your faithful people by sending into us your Holy Spirit, direct us by the light of that Spirit that we may have a right judgment in all things and rejoice at all times in your peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us turn to God's word. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house of the disciples had met, were locked for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Months ago, before Easter, when we were in the midst of Lent, I shared through a sermon a phrase that had been going around the internet, that this would be the lentiest Lent that we had ever Lented. It would be the lentiest because we were giving up more than we anticipated, more than we chose to. And then Holy Week arrived and we were still worshiping apart. And so the phrase became, this will be the holiest of holies we ever holied. Because like those first disciples, we were observing holy, sacred, and hard days. Not in the safety and the comfort of our congregations, but at the church, as the church at home. As faithful people creating church in the places where we do life. It was holy, it was hard, but it was good. And now we have gone the whole Easter season, worshiping in our homes, still actively and vibrantly the church, just not in our sanctuaries. And so today we have arrived at Pentecost. And as we approach today's celebration, the colors of red, the images of flame and wind and spirit. I am struck by the thought that this might be the costliest Pentecost that we have ever Pentecosted. It's not as lyrical as the other phrases, but I'm struck that Pentecost this year feels more costly. It feels like the celebration where we love to put on our red and sing about the spirit that is mysterious and beautiful. Instead of it being a day of holy fire, it feels as if there is this wet blanket upon us all, weighing us down, quieting and dampening that spirit, that vibrancy and that joy. In part, that might be due to the fact that it has been raining all week and it has been very humid. And so the air that surrounds us feels heavy. But also, because our congregations are still weighing the costs of gathering together in person. Also, because I have planned for yet another funeral and I've tried to tally the costs and the trade-offs of gathering safely to do grief work while also trying to keep precious loved ones safe to not create an environment of greater risk that will cause more harm to souls who are already grieving. Our world has been watching the cost of groceries go up and the cost of gas go down. We have been anticipating the costs of preparing for fall that will probably feel more like our winter and our spring. We can spend a lot of time adding up the costs of what we have lost and what has been taken from us. But we can also count and tally up the many joys that we have had. Extra time at home with your kids. Seeing birds in your yard that you didn't know visited this place of sanctuary. Gardening more less drive time to work, so an easier commute, less traffic on the road, and so less pollution in our air, less harm on our earth. 
as different as this way of worshiping feels, it is still good. It is still holy. Your living room is a sacred place at which the church thrives because you are encountering God in this space, in your place of worship. So as different as this feels today, we have encountered Pentecost before. We know that this is a day of holy wonder, of mystery and encouragement and deep encounterings with God. This season of Pentecost is also a place of waiting and hoping. This season trains us to be in a state of constant prayer and unfailing trust that we are not alone, that God is keeping the promises that were made to us in our baptisms, the promises that were made to us at the beginning of creation. Christ is resurrected. Christ is coming again, and Christ leaves the Holy Spirit with us today. But it still feels like a costly Pentecost because we want to be in our spaces. We want to be in, pe with, in connection and in proximity with people that we know and love. And the cost of the harm now needs to be outweighed with what we will gain by doing church, sitting six feet apart, not able to sing in the same space, not able to speak communally our confessions because of an airborne virus that now swirls around us when we stay in confined spaces. So it feels like a costly Pentecost because we are once again being made new and learning how to do faith through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, where Christ has led you where you are today. We are not reading our Pentecost story from the book of Acts, where tongues of flame rest on the heads of the disciples and they speak loud and long in countless languages. Today, our Pentecost story we read comes from John where we truly encountering a waiting that feels very aggravating for the disciples. We see a hope that for those first disciples feels as risky as it does for us, where their praying seemed futile because Christ was dead and the tomb was now empty, and so where was Christ? We are encountering a Pentecost that is asking of us much trust that we only tentatively give. Pentecost in the, in the Gospel of John happens on Easter morning. That same day when Jesus shows up outside an empty tomb and commissions his first apostle, Mary, for the holy task of running to tell the disciples that Christ is risen. And today we rejoice that the disciples who were not able to go to the tomb or chose not to go to the empty tomb. Christ comes to them. He shows up despite locked doors and skepticism. Not even fear of the world could prevent Jesus from being made known to those whom he loved. Now the fear of the disciples that brought them into the space behind locked doors kept them safe from a very real threat. And we don't know how long the disciples stay in that room after the Holy Spirit is gifted to them. So be mindful that we do not read this gospel as an opportunity to take, uh, as an opportunity to feel shameful about where we find ourselves because of very real threats for fear that is in our DNA, that is a biological gift from God that keeps us safe and helps us stay alive. But Christ does come on that first Pentecost in the Gospel of John in Acts to us today. Christ comes to give us the Spirit so we may overcome that fear. So we may take time to choose wisely how to be the church today. How to be the church in this way. So Jesus knows 
that the disciples are hiding because they are afraid for good reason. But Christ has come to set them free. Christ has come to give them the Holy Spirit, this constant and never failing presence that will not protect us from death and illness, but will protect us from despair. This Holy Spirit that will resurrect us when we encounter the countless little deaths that we encounter through our sin. Jesus doesn't give the Holy Spirit to prevent us from getting ill or to prevent us from dying. Jesus Christ gives us the Holy Spirit to help us journey through those valleys of death, those times of inevitable illness, but to also help us care for creation and be the church wisely. Jesus Christ gives us the Holy Spirit so when once again we remind ourselves that we have sinned and been separated from God, we can have new life. We can hit a reset button and begin again to live as the creation God meant us to be. We continue to have the Holy Spirit poured over us this day. The Holy Spirit is once again breathed into you. So we are officially signed, sealed, and ready to be delivered. We are gods. There is nothing that can change that now. We are on a trajectory to be sent out into the world because that is what the Holy Spirit does. Send us out into the world with our gifts and our talents and our intuition and our wisdom to be the best, most caring, love your neighbors above all else church we are meant to be. The world will know the compassion, the love, and the care of God through how we show our love, by how we show compassion and how we care for those who are near us and those who are far from us. So I ask you on this costliest of Pentecosts, how costly is your freedom from sin and death and the power of evil? Christ paid the price of your salvation. Our sin is not an action or a failure on our part. Sin in the Gospel of John is being separated from God. Sin in the Gospel of John is turning our backs on the love and the grace and the promise that God has extended to us. Sin is putting other things as more essential in our lives than God and then living our lives focused on only that, forgetting how God is a part of all things, how God is the center of our life. So when Christ gives the Holy Spirit to the disciples, he's not commissioning them as morality police. He's giving them the Holy Spirit not to judge others, but he's gifted them with the Holy Spirit so that God's grace and that Christ's peace can make forgiveness a viable option in this world. The Holy Spirit comes and resides in us so that wherever we go, when we extend forgiveness, when we speak about the mercy of God and the compassion of Christ, this life-giving nature that is the Holy Spirit does not condemn others, but sets them free. We are a diverse multifaceted people of God equipped to liberate and set free a vast creation from all of the things that distract us from God, from all of the times and reasons we put something else before God, for all the times we turn away from God's love and try to be our own saviors. So how costly is it for us to continue to wait in this season of Pentecost? How long did God's chosen people wait for a Messiah? Far longer than we have been waiting for Christ to return again. And though these last two and a half months have felt agonizingly long, it is a brief 
moment compared to the vastness of God's story, the vastness of God's narrative to keep you in God's creation, to care for you, to make you whole, to give you eternal life now. Hope does not have an expiration date. Waiting longer to be together is not going to make God's hope or God's patience or his steadfastness run out. Our hope is in Christ Jesus and Christ existed before time. Christ will exist long after time is over. So then we must ask ourselves, how costly is it to trust and pray just a little bit more in this season of Pentecost? Are we expecting God to show up and do miraculous signs to earn our trust? Because God has already proven to be faithful. God has already shown that God is faithful to you, that God is keeping the promises to you in this day. And there is nothing more trustworthy than a God who would rather die on a cross than be parted from you. So if we are to trust in something, trust in this, that the God who overcame death to be near you yet again, that God can transcend our human experience of social distancing to be near you, to create worship and church and sanctuary right where you are. Our God who overcame death for the sheer love of a broken world can make your living room into a church. Our God can make you into the church that is mobile, that smiles and cares and extends forgiveness to a creation that doesn't know it needs it, but desperately does. Did praying become too laborious when we were separated that we stopped doing it? No. No, I think the world has prayed more in these months than we have in the last couple of years. And in my 10 years of ministry, this first year of pastoring, I have prayed with you more and I have prayed for you more often than in those full 10 years. The church was never about buildings. So the church was never closed. We simply followed Christ's example and went out into the world to be church. And yes, we will need to learn new ways to encourage and build each other up. No, we will not stay separated forever, forever because it is good for us to be together. We are not meant to be alone, but we will weather this storm however long it takes and we will be united and brought back to new life once again as a congregation, just as you are being brought to new life now. In this day, the Holy Spirit is being breathed into you and filling you up. And it is good. And it is new life. And it is enough. It is enough. Pentecost life, however costly it is, is a gift. The cost of the season is not what we have given up. The cost of the season is what we have gained and how it transforms us, how it demands that we live as people of God. Pentecost in John happens on Easter morning. And those three days of grief while Jesus laid in the tomb was excruciating and painful. And Christ came and gave them the spirit and said, peace be with you. Go and forgive the sins of others. The grief of their loss was still fresh. The disbelief of the resurrection still hangs in the air. And when the violence and the injustice of Jesus' death still felt like a sucker punch to the gut, when the air had been ripped out of the disciples' lungs, Jesus Christ comes and breathes into them the Spirit. To be an Easter people, 
is to be resurrected after the trauma of the cross, to be a people of new life in impossible circumstances, to encounter Christ at the pain of the cross and then again after the resurrection. So to be a Pentecost people post-Easter is to boldly acknowledge the broken parts of the world that need forgiveness and to work for that forgiveness so that people can be set free from the shame and the brokenness of life. The presence of the Holy Spirit is not something you are awarded for some sort of outstanding behavior. And the Spirit of God isn't a diploma that you get after obtaining a certain level of education. The Holy Spirit shows up when you are lying on your couch for the fourth day in a row in your yoga pants, crying because you are desperate for life to simply be normal again. And the Holy Spirit shows up when you start to sob in relief because your kids were actually nice to each other and you didn't have to yell at them to do it. The Holy Spirit of God shows up and breathes new life into you when the unemployment check arrives or when the protest for justice gives voice to our lamentations or when we hear a song that reminds us of someone that we love on a day when we are feeling so alone. The Holy Spirit breathes into the lives of people who have been locked behind doors for fear of the world. A fear needed to keep us safe, but a fear that Christ overcomes. The Holy Spirit sinks into our DNA, sinks into our DNA and trains us how to encounter grief and anxiety and depression and our addiction when it has us rooted to our beds. The Holy Spirit blows wild and free like a spring storm, surprising us, reviving us, reminding us of God's power and might. But the Holy Spirit also breathes calmly, intentionally, precisely right into the places that need new life and resurrection. The Holy Spirit comes to give hope, to show us what we are trusting in, to remind us that while we wait, God is very busy. The Holy Spirit is upon you this day. And as we continue to wait, God is active and busy working for the sake of the church and the world. And as we continue to hope, God transforms those hopes into good works that sustain those around us. And as we trust and as we pray, the Holy Spirit gives us new life so that once again, we can follow Christ out into the world just as we were always meant to. So may your day be spirit-filled and Christ-led. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is a special music offering that has been put together by the American Lutheran Choral Musicians. It is O Day Full of Grace, and it includes 1,300 musicians, instrumentalists, vocalists. So thank you. Please join us in singing O Day Full of Grace with the world on this day of Pentecost. And thank you for the gift and the labor that went into making this offering.
Let us pray. On this day of Pentecost, we unite in prayer, asking God to send the Holy Spirit on the church, the world, and all who are in need. The communal response to our prayer is, Come Holy Spirit. We pray for the church around the globe. For the Eastern Orthodox Church, we pray, Come Holy Spirit. For the Roman Catholic Church, we pray, Come Holy Spirit. For Protestant and Anglican churches, we pray, Come Holy Spirit. For Pentecostal churches, we pray, Come Holy Spirit. For Evangelicals and Independents, we pray, Come Holy Spirit. For our own congregations, we pray, Come Holy Spirit. And for everyone who searches for you, we pray, Come Holy Spirit. Restore with your breath the whole creation, especially the lands and waters laden with pollution and animals whose habitats are threatened. For your earth we pray, come Holy Spirit. Send your spirit on the leaders of nations, on legislators and on judges, that the people of the world will benefit from your justice and your peace. For the nations of the world we pray, come Holy Spirit. Visit all who are suffering, all who feel hopeless and all who face death. Send healing to those we name here before you, in our hearts or aloud. For all who are in need, we pray, come Holy Spirit. Restore to health those who have contracted the virus. Uphold health care workers, grant jobs to those who are unemployed, and assist researchers in discovering a vaccine. For all who are confronting the coronavirus and its effects, we pray, come Holy Spirit. Bless those who are graduating from schools and universities. Give our youth hope for their future. For our graduates, we pray, come Holy Spirit. Show our nation and our churches how to connect with those whose language we cannot speak. For the speakers of every language under the sun, we pray, come Holy Spirit. And as Elizabeth welcomed Mary into her home, give us ways during this time to share with one another the faithfulness that we receive from you. Surprise us with unexpected grace. For family members and friends, we pray, come Holy Spirit. Hear also the cries of our own hearts, Lord. For ourselves, we pray, come Holy Spirit. Receive our praise for all who for centuries have gone before us in the faith, from the first Pentecost throughout Christian history and up to this week, that at the end, we and all the saints will rejoice in your presence, we pray, come Holy Spirit. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you breathe life into our bones, and your Spirit brings truth to the world. Send us this Spirit. Transform us by your truth and give us language to proclaim your gospel through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
I invite you to join with me and pray the prayer that Christ taught us using the words that your tradition has taught you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The God of all grace bless us now and forever. Amen. Our sending hymn is Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. It's number 398 in the red hymnal, and in the green hymnal, it's 257. Please join us in singing. of Christ be with you always. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Mm -hmm.